Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome. We'll be starting in a few seconds. If you're in the session, uh, a very warm welcome on my part. We've got three very excellent panelists. Um, but before I introduce them, before they introduce themselves, I'd like to say a brief, something briefly about our topic. Um, we've seen the disruption caused by COVID-19 and really, even before the pandemic, globalization was to a certain extent already in retreat. But now, thanks to globalization, that trend has really accelerated. And we've been used to, for example, long and complex supply chains, but they've been totally disrupted or very near totally disrupted. And many sectors have um, had to suffer. The garment sector, for example, as well as falling global GDP. There's no longer unfettered global trade. There's no longer unfettered global travel. <clears throat> and now we seem to be witnessing some form of deglobalization. That might sound quite negative, but our panel panelists here um, are going to offer um, some positive outlooks on this perspective. This panel deals with transitioning to a new globalization, and we have four, sorry, we have three distinguished experts on this panel. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves in a moment. On my right, um, in the top right, is Trista Bridges. She's the principal and co-founder of Read the Air based in Japan, so a long way east from where I am in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Just below her is Howard. Maybe you could give us a wave. I should could have said that before. Howard, <laughs> Howard Wu, who's the president for Can Achieve in Canada. He is now, he's stuck, well not stuck, but he is in Shanghai, speaking from Shanghai. And just below me is Doug Brunke, who's the founder and chief executive officer of the Global Chamber in the USA. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like our panelists to introduce themselves in a bit more detail. Trista Bridges, um, your focus is sustainability, but please tell us, a bit more about yourself. Sure. Thanks so much uh, for having me today. I'm very much looking forward to the panel. I'm Trist My name is Trista Bridges. Um, I'm originally um, from the US. Uh, I also uh, lived many years in Europe and also am a French citizen as well. Um, and uh, I moved here to Japan about six years ago. Um, I've worked in various capacities throughout my career and particularly my kind of background and expertise is in the area of strategy and strategic decision making um, amongst corporations. Um, but over the last few years, I've been working around this topic of sustainability because from my perspective, sustainability is no longer a nice to do thing for organizations and corporations and also countries and societies. It's a must do uh, and strategically important thing for us to kind of take on and within companies. So what I'm more looking to do is kind of helping organizations to make that transition. Um, because, you know, if, if anybody who spent, you know, five minutes in a business school in the last 30, 40 years knows that until recently, this was not uh, the principal topic we focused on. Um, so, yeah, so that's basically the focus of my work. And again, uh, really great uh, being here and having a discussion today. Thanks, Trista. Um, Trista from Japan or based in Japan, but she also has links with Europe, France and also originally to the U.S. So thank you, Trista. Um, Howard, I think your video's dropped, but um, I think we can still hear you. Can you um, introduce yourself, please, briefly? Yes, sure. Uh, never mind about my video because uh, I had the same problem uh, last time when we uh, did the trial. So uh, I'm I'm scared. I'd better leave it, and otherwise it will stop me. You know, uh, totally. I don't know. What, uh, anyway, uh, can actually, we have been doing basically. Two line of uh, business, I call it. One is uh, we have been working with the different universities by referring students to them in uh, U.S., Canada, and Australia, for example. And also we have been facilitating some uh, colleges and institutions who want to, who, who were interested in setting up their partnerships with the Chinese uh, counterparts in the past, basically. And 
Uh, another thing is we have been uh, hoping Chinese nationals who want to move overseas through immigration programs, particularly business or investment uh, immigration programs, like um, probably to uh, familiar to some of you, like EB-5 program in the U.S. Uh, some uh, some provinces in Canada also run different programs. So we assist those interested people with their visas, you know, with their investment, etc. Basically, so COVID has been presenting. Uh, it's not a threat. I mean, has been a, a barrier. Basically, has been a, a big problem to uh, companies like us, you know, who are dealing. Uh, with the uh, international counterparts, we have to, you know, other in terms of moving people between borders or, move, or moving uh, investment uh, or immigration in general. So, but uh, my belief is, you know, globalization will come back, but probably in different format. That's my my point, major point. Thank Thanks, you, Howard. Thank you, Howard. And we'll be exploring that point in more detail. And um, our final panelist who will introduce himself shortly is Doug Brunke uh, from far in the West in the US. Doug, can you briefly say a few words about yourself? I, I sure can. Like Trista, I've had a lifelong interest in sustainability. In fact, I'm a chemical engineer originally interested in cleaning up the world. And that took me to becoming an engineer with the DuPont company. So that's kind of a strange uh, starting point. And I became an accidental international person through DuPont, through expat assignments, including Japan. So Trista and I have a lot in common, including our East Coast uh, upbringing as well. Uh, I am the founder and CEO of Global Chamber. I do believe in globalization. I do believe that... It's on the on the rise and on the move, and it does improve the world. And in fact, we end up helping companies export and anywhere in the world and become international everywhere in the world and believing that ultimately trade does help the world in terms of greater understanding. And it's something that, as Kofi Annan said, arguing against globalization is like arguing against gravity. We're, we're going there. It's just a matter of time. And so I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Thanks, Doug. And just to put us in perspective, this into perspective, Global Chamber consists of 525 metropolitan areas, I saw, uh, and you're active in many, many countries. So how many countries are you active in? Every country except for, uh, actually, maybe to some extent, even in Iran, uh, uh, but not in North Korea. Uh, so, but basically everywhere. And the idea was to help facilitate trade. You know, you needed a chamber of commerce, not just in your local town, but everywhere. And so that's really, you know, you can tell where I believe globalization is headed and, you know, what I think is necessary to not just improve business, but improve the world. So I'm, I am looking forward to the conversation today. Excellent. We can explore that later. So my name is Peter Perra. I'm a professor, um, last but not least, I'm a professor at a university here in Switzerland, um, the FHNW, which stands for Fachhochschule in Nordrhein-Westfalen. We're also very active in globalization. Uh, we support SMEs in many countries, but particularly in Asia. And the countries that have been mentioned, China um, and Southeast Asia and other areas in Asia, for example, India, we're active there, not only in an academic context, but also supporting SMEs. So I've got a strong interest in the whole context of this discussion. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about transition transitioning to a new globalization. And I say we do have some members of the audience. I will try to open up questions to you once we get further into the discussion. So please stay on board and follow this. It stands to be an excellent discussion. If we look back now at the experiences of COVID, some people really argue that pandemics could totally destroy globalization. But while others state that globalization is really central to the healing of economies. And my first question to the panelists, to our distinguished guests here on the panel, is how can we inspire 
a new deal on globalization to overcome this fragility of our economies when really globalization halts and isolates them. So I'd like to start um, in the East, in Japan, with Trista, um, which is, of course, um, a good place to start. Trista, how do you see that? Oh, I mean, I think that's a very, <laughs> very tough, tough question. You know, how do we kind of inspire confidence? I think that, you know, first of all, I think one of the things that we in this pandemic that we probably would make, which made it so difficult, I think, was that we didn't really optimize for what could possibly go wrong. And we had a tendency to kind of put all of our eggs in one basket, right? So we basically had this kind of philosophy that, you know, which is to an extent correct, right? That some countries are good at some things, that's what they should do. Other countries are good at other things, that's what they should do. And I think that that's, you know, that's, you know, generally probably correct, right? However, um, I think that that was taken to kind of an extreme that created a lot of situations that, you know, created a situation that uh, put us in uh, a difficult situation in terms of COVID. So I think what's going to probably happen is there's going to be a re-examining of what countries should be doing and what businesses should be doing in their region, what they should be doing globally. Um, I think that um, a lot of people who were kind of unaware, I think of the extent that things were maybe distributed around the world were quite upset actually. Um, so my adopted country, France, for example, you remember at the beginning of the pandemic when nobody had PPE, um, we still struggle in terms of vaccines and, and where these are made and how they're produced and where ingredients come from. And people were really shocked that nobody made those types of products on the territory any longer. Um, I think that's probably not going to happen in the future. I think what's going to happen is there'll probably be a certain level of, um, of production of certain items, strategic items that we will probably do in country. But I do agree um, with what was stated earlier, which is that you know globalization is with us and it's going to continue to be with us. It's just a matter of how it should be configured to kind of bring the most benefit um, to our countries and also globally. Thanks, Trista. That's a very good start. And um, we can come back on some of those points. So globalization, and it's just a question of what form. And we can pick up that later. Howard, you're active in Shanghai, in Canada, and you mentioned about this transatlantic uh, sort of um, or transnational um, business that you're active in. How are things, how do you see things in terms of the New Deal on globalization? Um, how do you see things from your perspective? Uh, I think, let me put it this way. First of all, I think globalization will come back uh, sooner or later. But the first of all, uh, we need to have the pandemic, you know, come down in, a, in, in some sort of uh, fashion so that the, first of all, people can move conditionally across the borders. That's important. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just as Trista mentioned, through this pandemic, pandemic, nations or countries will need to rethink about what as a country will do at home and what will it buy from overseas. So that's a, that's, that trend will be explored, I think, at least within the next couple of years after the pandemic stopped, stops. Uh, so... Okay. Yep. Sorry, carry on. Yep. And the third point I wish to make is um, I've, I think even worldwide, probably there will be forms of regional, you know, instead of uh, uh, worldwide. Like a supply, probably there are some, some uh, sort of uh, like uh, uh, supply chain based clusters. You know, within the clusters, some countries will participate. And the government, for example, government will play a new role, at least in the beginning of that, that thing to happen. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Howard. So a more regional focus. And I believe 
Um, your country, China, is also um, sort of focusing on regional things as well. Of course, we've seen the internationalization, but also I noticed in through friends in China, they're also looking at their regions very actively as well. Doug, mm -hmm. um, over to you in terms of the US and your global chamber, which, as you said, is pretty much active in every country. How do you see the future? Or how do you see um, this new deal on globalization? And how will it overcome the fragility of our economies when it's really being seen to halt and isolate them? Just just a quick point on your mention of the U.S. I mean, a lot of the reason why I formed Global Chamber was I was frustrated by the the U.S. Chamber because it's such a homer. It's so U.S. centric that it feels uncomfortable, honestly, to me as an American, you know, that I believe more on the trade side. In fact, we talk about the global tribe, people who are international. Uh, yes, we have probably a flag behind us. I'm an American and my family's from Poland and, and Germany uh, originally, my wife from Greece. And so we have a connection to those countries, but ultimately we're global citizens and, mm -hmm. and kind of prefer we view the world in, in that way. I think, you know, kind of in this next phase, what the pandemic has inspired is, you know, over nationalism and I would call it somewhat unenlightened views by uh, many people that where they, as Trista mentioned, got frustrated, like, well, wait a minute, you know, we don't make everything, you know, and so that's kind of naive, you know, and, and to some extent, some people carry it to like, well, we should be making everything, you know, well, not exactly, you know, that it's really kind of a fundamental misunderstanding about how do we become an efficient system around the world. And the way we do that is what Trista mentioned is we recognize that some people can do things better than others because of their own skill sets, because of their wage level, because of a variety of reasons. And so we become an interdependent system. And so we've always been that to some level, and we've continued to become more and more of that. Then we go through these periods where we go through this sudden realization, like we can't make everything ourselves or we don't. So let's figure out how to do that. Then we, when we realize that we can't, that we go back to, well, okay, so we do have to have some level of interdependence. And so what level, again, back to Trista's point is, let's reevaluate really what makes sense. You know, we're not going to make everything. So which countries, which areas are we going to develop strategic alliances with and what types of products and services will we make versus others? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing the point like we're really actually thinking through this and some people do. You know, you think about uh, President um, uh, of Singapore who in 1960 took the country uh, and really quite disheveled to a point where they became a world power to a large extent. And they really thought about what's it going to take for this little 35 mile wide island to become a world trade power, you know, to be with no resources, you know. So how do you become how do you able to do that? You've got to do a lot of thinking. And so a lot of countries are thinking through that. And a lot of entrepreneurs everywhere around the world, we're fortunate to see them all over the world. They're really taking action right now because they see opportunities. The disruption caused by a pandemic is creating business opportunities like we've never seen before. So, so it's, it's an exciting time in the world, no question. Indeed it is. And maybe we can pick up on a few of those positive things as well. You mentioned opportunities as well as um, some of the challenges there. And Trista started off this discussion talking about this. Um, we will really need to become an efficient system. And maybe I can come back to Trista with this because I think there's uh, a lot of strong link with sustainability here, Trista. Mm -hmm. um, how do you see that efficient system that both you, Howard and Doug have all touched on. How do you think it will shape? Are we going to leave it up to the world leaders or, or is there something that we can do in an entrepreneurial way? And what about companies that you're advising, for example? How can they deal with these challenges to become more resilient? No, absolutely. I think that, you know, to be perfectly honest, I don't think that many 
government governments now, just in terms of the how they're structured and how our governance systems work, are really equipped to be the ones, the only ones to address this problem. We'll say. I think um, companies, you know, are are of such a scale now. Whether they be you know SMEs, there's so many of them, and they really help drive our economies, or they be very large organizations. Um, I think on the production side, um, one thing that we know is that if we have good transparency into our supply chains, if we are buying from um, entities around the world that take into account things like good labor practices, um, sourcing ingredients responsibly, um, making sure things that are made that kind of aren't harmful to people in some capacity, it makes um, the overall supply chain much more resilient and it makes companies much more resilient over the long run. So one of the areas that um, that I work in is advising around ESG, and ESG was initially a framework that was in finance, but in its origins, it really was about kind of risk, good risk management, you know. And at the end of the day, a lot of this is really about that, you know. How do we have a system that helps us kind of head off the risks that that may come to us? How do we make sure that you know that all our participants and actors within that supply chain around the world? So you know, Doug talked a lot about, you know, almost like um, a system where we are really equals. You know, I, I would argue that the system we've had thus far, that, that's not really how things operated, right? Um, I think having that transparency and being able and really kind of ensuring that, you know, that we remove some of those risks in the supply chain will help us have better, healthier relationships with different stakeholders, right, um, within the system that we talked about earlier. Thanks, Trista. Um, so risk management, um, I think it's fair to say a lot of companies missed out on that. You know, they were caught short yeah. by the pandemic. So um, maybe we could pick up on, on that point, Howard, uh, as we move forward. And I also like the mention of SMEs. It's not just about M&Es, the large corporates. Mm -hmm. Here in Switzerland, I think we have about 99% SMEs, and that's really the backbone of our economy. And many other European economies are like that. So I'm also speaking here for SMEs. But how do you see that risk management, um, Howard? And what about the transparency that Trista mentioned as well? Transparency in supply chains. Any comments along those lines? I think when talking about risk management, there yeah, is exactly there will, yeah there will be. Uh, Definitely something need to consider on the micro level, I mean, on the enter enterprise level, entities level, as well as when we are talking about the globalization, I think there will also be an issue to be, and there will also be an issue to be considered by, by the country, by, by each of the nations. And because we were talking about, uh, when you're talking about globalization, we are always talking about the who is doing better than the others. I mean, in terms of, uh, uh, skill set in term in terms of uh, what it, what uh, it has in general in terms of resources for example etc but that's something when we were talking when we were talking about without a pandemic like we have been experiencing so when that happens I think risk will be a top priority for both companies to consider as well as the country on the government of a, you know, government, uh, uh, governing bodies of, uh, of nations, of countries. That, that would be a, a key issue to, to look at, at least within the next uh, couple of years. Thank you very much, Howard. And it would be good if we can, um, I mean, risk management is something we know as a term, um, but in terms of the pandemic, it might be good to really focus on maybe some concrete examples of how SMEs can really equip themselves better as well. So maybe we could move on to that in a moment. But first of all, Doug, um, risk management. I think you, your global chamber has also um, had to deal with certain aspects of risk. Is that right? Well, our members do, right? So our members are exporters and people doing international business. And what, you know, what inspired me to start it was 
the fact that most fail, you know, or certainly have failures along the way because they don't know what they don't know. They don't have the right resources. They, they have a hard time reaching clients in other countries. They have a hard time deciding which country to go to next. Those are all challenges that are natural pains that we resolve. Uh, I did want to make a couple points uh, kind of to reemphasize and also maybe add to the conversation. You know, first and foremost regarding risk management, um, we are, as a world, interdependent, um, and that's happened since Silk Road days, right? However, in those days, it was a little bit more, you know, uh, not integral to life necessarily as it is today, where interdependence means something much more significant, where if silicon chips are not available, you know, made in Taiwan, then it shuts down auto plants in the U.S. And so there's a level of interdependence and risk associated with making decisions about where certain key things are sourced. And hence Trista's point around maybe we really need to rethink that country to country and business to business. I think naturally the process is inefficient. And that means that really the opportunity is with entrepreneurs. You know, and, and certainly you mentioned, Peter, uh, multinationals. I think having worked in a multinational and now working mainly with SMBs and, and also midsize, the opportunity is with them. That they, they need to navigate where are the needs. And so let's find a way to supply product and services where there are gaps. We're waiting for the government doesn't make any sense because they're always slow to the game. And in fact, we as business people at the Global Chamber, we encourage business people to, to keep government informed and advise them of how slow they are and how they need to react. But ultimately, almost always, they're slow to the game and really just want to keep them um, moving forward. Something like, for instance, if fashion, if products or fabric uh, apparel are made in Bangladesh, as we saw decades ago, and the gov and the companies you know, basically run sweatshops and lock people in and buildings burn down and kill people. Those are those are requirements then for the gut. That's a case where the government kind of building my point. They were slow to the game of understanding, OK, our wages are low. We can do this, but we should be looking out for our people, you know. And so those those are areas where business people can say, well, wait a minute. You know, we we need to. You know, we need to do this. However, we need to do it the proper way. And so those are parts of you know, management of a risk, managing the risk, but also keeping people everywhere around the world alive while we create more and more of an interdependent system around the world. It's not pretty all the time, but it is something that's evolving and changing and one that we as business leaders need to drive by both looking for and capturing the business opportunities and also keeping stakeholders like governments involved in the process so that they hopefully can make less mistakes. Thank you, Doug. Um, and maybe we can come back later for some examples of how Global Chamber is um, sort of supporting its members with topics like risk management. But let's move on and uh, move on to Trista. Um, and um, maybe we could stay with risk and this point about um, how corporates and or how you can help corporates, how we as um, advisors to corporates can support them in this process of risk management. How how what what's the sort of process here then, Trista? Mm -hmm. I, I think it, you know, again, I think it probably depends on the size of the organization. I think one of the things that is really important to highlight for, I think, for big organizations, just sometimes I think they don't necessarily have the transparency or, or I'd say the view, the broader view about all the ways that they kind of impact the world and all the people that they come in contact with. So there's lots of really good frameworks that you can use to kind of think through that. But I think that's kind of the first step. You know, you have a lot of people, especially in large organizations that are just kind of showing up and doing their job every day. So I think, I think we also have to kind of not forget that there's people in these companies and oftentimes their motivations aren't necessarily as scientific perhaps as we would hope that they would be, right? They'd see the big picture and they'd come up with the best answer. 
that's not how they approach things. So I think that, you know, on a micro level, even within large organizations or, you know, certainly SMEs, um, you know, getting them to kind of understand, okay, who are all the participants and stakeholders that you need to be cognizant of and how can the decisions of these stakeholders affect you? If things go well, how can they can affect you? How, if things fall apart, how can they affect you? So, you know, in my work with companies, that's kind of where I start always. Um, and then I think the second point is, and this kind of ties back to the sustainability point, what are the real kind of burning issues that are really starting to affect business today around the world? And what we're seeing is, and another time I was in there mentioning that, is a lot of the challenges that companies are facing are the same ones that companies are facing in Sub-Saharan Africa, or the same ones they're facing in the US, the same things they're facing you know, in Southeast Asia. Um, we're starting to come together a lot more because our problems are just getting so much bigger. And I think COVID is probably one example of that, but certainly the climate crisis, there's so many um, that you have to get businesses think about. So what, you know, in my work with them, I really try to get them to kind of think through, you know, first of all, the stakeholder piece, and then also um, what are the issues that are going to be affecting their business in the near term and long term. There, there's alignment, but there's differences, right? Because you mentioned yeah. Africa. The when we, you know, since we're doing business everywhere, we kind of see like a Nepal circumstance, for instance. In Nepal, yeah. it's fairly you know, very tight system where there's not very much interaction across borders except local. They're not really in the global supply chain mm. channel. And then you go to Africa where historically what's happened is th they've created products, agricultural products as an example, and ship those across. And then they come back as a manufactured food yes. product. Mm -hmm. That's that's changing, right? That's evolving. Yeah. So in Nepal, they're kind of coming up to speed in terms of integrating into the world. Africa's at a different level. And what's happening now is people realize, well, wait a minute, the most of the wealth that's being created is outside our borders. And then, you know, we need to export. And so that's really the driving force behind what we do is we've got to find ways around the world for people to export better and less with less mm -hmm. risk, Peter, to, to your point. And so in Africa, what's happening is it's really exciting to see it in Clubhouse. If you're not part of Clubhouse, I highly recommend it. Africa mm -hmm. and how it's handled there is one of the most exciting things about what I see there because there's so many talented people saying, well, wait a minute, we got to get this going and be able to do that. Uh, in places like Nigeria, 13% of GDP is exports, only 13%. When in Austria, it's close to 60% of GDP is exports. There's so much opportunity. And ultimately, exports, right? You ship a product over and money comes back. We want the money because that creates good education systems and roads and infrastructure and things like that. And so e these evolving countries need to get more involved. They are getting more involved. Involved. And that goes to your point, Peter, about what we do is reducing the risk so that you have clients, that you have products, hopefully, that the world wants. You know that and you go about doing that. And that's what's really exciting to watch going on in the world right now is, is, is countries realizing that, hey, we need to get in the game um, and, and, and hopefully doing it as fast and efficiently as possible. Excellent. Thank you very much. Howard, do you have do you have any points to pick up on that about um, exports evolving and risk um, as we've touched on those? Uh, I just give you some. I just share with you and uh, like you know companies like like us and what we did uh, when the COVID you know first happened, first appeared. Uh, basically. We did a lot of travels. We, you know, we had a lot of meetings in the in the past, just like everyone does, you know, in, in business. But we we uh, within the three months, first the three months of the COVID pandemic, we uh, we started to move from traditionally, you know, meetings, uh, telephone calls, you know, te te teleconferences, but to a kind of web based services. Uh, we did a lot of things uh, in that area. In order to reduce the risk, you know, that the, the pandemic could do to our system. Uh, I think uh, also in the meantime, we we are prepared. We we are trying to fig figuring out what new opportunities are appearing. 
what we can do now in in uh, in the uh, during the pandemic and also after the pandemic we are trying to figure out what what you know what what kind of new opportunities we we can uh, grab i just share with you what what we generally internally what we've been doing thank you that is also very enlightening and um i think the new opportunities is maybe something we can uh talk a little bit about now i'm kind of aware in switzerland there are quite a few companies that are active in supply chain transparency and Brisper um mentioned that that really this is a huge topic um, and and in particular new technology so um you know using qr codes for example there's a company called scantrust that's very active in asia tracing or helping companies trace their product lines and things like that is that something that um you see uh, as a big potential there trista you know a lot of activity there in transparency and and product tracing um before as you mentioned you know we had to, we bought a shirt from uh, what we thought was bangladesh but it was a, it was there were many many different parts but nowadays i think the technology is there to really trace many of these products how do you see that transparency and how do you see the sort of evolution of those technologies and how companies can make full use of them yeah so i think that there's i mean obviously the last several years there's been a lot of discussion about blockchain which you know people often kind of reference uh, when talking about this particular issue um i think that technology is still one that you know is evolving and needs lots of work and i think a lot of people still don't fully understand what it is so <laughs> i think <laughs> with the thing about technology is how do we ensure that it's accessible to people that people understand its application um and it also can be something that not just you know massive organizations like coca-cola or um uh H&M or this is these massive organizations can use but also how small organizations can use i do think transparency though is being probably um if i talk a little bit about the sustainability space uh, this the area that i know uh know well um there's kind of two main drivers that i think are shifting the need for this i think the first thing is um as you probably know in this space one of the key drivers of uh sustainability within business at the moment are investors so companies basically say okay well you know we're going to hit x target or we're going to reduce our emissions by this level or we're going to ensure that you know everybody in our our supply chain um is operating responsibly um they make that promise and for many years they would make this promise and people just kind of would take them at their word and hope that they did something one day But what's happening now actually is this is starting to shift where you know it's not about necessarily checking a box or just making a promise um investors and other stakeholders are insisting to see progress and when you insist to see progress that means you need to have information you need to have data there's pretty much no way you can shore up your supply chain without understanding what's going on in the supply chain perhaps two or three or four or five steps removed from you So this is I think a really important point. Second uh the second key driver is the kind of climate question, right? So we have scope 1 emissions, scope 2 emissions, which I think people understand scope 1 is kind of about you, scope 2 is kind of the other processes around you that are connected to you. Scope 3 is everything else. So all this other stuff, there's pretty much no way you can figure out what your emissions are in scope 3. without having transparency, without understanding what's going on with everyone in the system. So I think that these drivers are going to really help kind of push these technologies forward. Um but yes, it's it's imperfect. It's still kind of in its infancy, but there is a there are a lot of great things happening and I think 5 to 10 years from now, I think we'll know much better what's going on within that system than we do today. Thanks Trista. And I understand you just written or fairly recently published a book that touches on these things so the path to sustainable business Yeah. and how the SDGs changed everything it, it does it pick up on those points yeah it we do talk a bit about that we have a whole kind of part on kind of innovations that are coming and we talk a lot about um supply chains and transparency and such particularly in sectors like uh fashion which Doug uh touched upon a little bit earlier um it's a huge topic there um as well as in many industries food as well as another huge one uh, yeah. but yeah we do talk about that in the book as well fascinating thanks Trista Doug would you like to follow on pick up on any of those points 
Yeah, I think um, re- really good points made there. I think what's you know what we're seeing is um, the possibilities, um, and we talked a little bit more. We talked about you know that the world is it's it's not a finished product, right? And the fact that it's not finished is is an opportunity for 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 people. The transparency part is is natural. The technology evolution is natural. Uh, artificial intelligence is another example of, of that's changing e-commerce. That's changing um, f- driving. You know, of uh, sh- shipping and logistics. You know, it's uh, the the world is changing very rapidly, and it's making the world smaller. And it's also uh, opening up new opportunities. We're we're opening centers of excellence around artificial intelligence and in, an in initial twelve cities around the world because we recognize that small businesses and other all businesses need to incorporate these technologies into their business to be to be more successful I think I, a couple a couple other key points that I think that are happening that we should be aware of when I, I'll date myself my first uh, trip overseas was to South Korea and I, I very vividly remember in the Busan South Korea airport a billboard that didn't have any words it just visually showed that if you buy foreign products, our money goes overseas and that you know it's it really impressed on me you know this many years later that you know the government and the the, the strategy was so solidly anti trade you know other than us exporting so really the message was let's export and what i saw i saw for the next 10 or 20 years in south korea whenever i would visit for instance hyundai which at the time was horrifically terrible company in terms of quality of products and they pumped me every time i was there what's toyota doing what's you know they actively you know they had a they had a thought process both on the business side and the government side to get better and boy did they get better the amazing company now um because of the progress that they've made so now Fast forward to yesterday, I was in a call with an e-commerce company called Coupon, a member of Global Chamber, and they want foreign products into South Korea. <laughs> so, so think about that evolution, right? So the, gov- the here's a country that basically said only export. <laughs> and now, today, they want foreign products because they can afford it and they can do it. And and the, the country has evolved to that point. And so that's encouraging. And it goes back to the point that, you know, there are... An, an infinite number of opportunities out there. That's why we exist is to help members navigate, you know, where do I go? You know, there's so much, you know, how do I do this with lower risk? But be, because there's an ecosystem here that we want people to tap into because it satisfies these needs, whether it's in South Korea or anywhere in the world. And so let's use technology to get there, but recognize that it's it's endless and and we, and why not take advantage of it? Because there's there's opportunity there. Thanks for sharing that, Doug. Fascinating examples of how technology is used. So, for example, artificial intelligence and also that sort of timeline um, from Korea, the examples from many years ago. I won't ask you when that was, but uh, sounds like a long time ago. And now the change <laughs> in requirements. So fascinating to hear that. Howard, would you like to just touch on any positive things that you can uh, you've witnessed or that you've experienced uh, as part of this um, transition in globalization? Uh, or, or maybe how you see the future in terms of um, a positive focus? I, I, th- I think uh, a lot of new areas need to be uh, looked at uh, or some old areas need to be re, you know restudied because uh, the pandemic has changed our way of thinking the way of doing business like i said when we were you know a couple of years ago working with the different uh uh Different institutions in different countries. We assume 
if we want to meet someone, we can go there. And, and we have to go there. But nowadays, you don't have to. There are new technologies available for you to communicate with them. So, yeah, I think general, generally, uh, uh, the pandemic will open or has opened ways for us to think in terms of risks and opportunities. Both. And, and Peter, I would add to that that, you know, in, like in our case, we, I think we have five events today and one of them coming up in a couple hours is one global chamber, Dhaka, Bangladesh has a young global leaders event. Six young global leaders, half of them from Bangladesh and the other half from around the world. And I think we can't ignore the fact that young people have the world in their hand. You know, they recognize that technology exists and it's right there. And and many of them are really uh, driven to have an impact, you know, not just in business, but just in the world. How do we end climate change? Why can't we end climate change? You know, how, why can't I do what I want to do to have impact or make money or whatever the, their particular driver is? And so I think you mentioned about technology it also is young people and recognizing that technology is powerful. People like myself who, you know, uh, aren't in full grasp of all of technology appreciate it, but don't can't always capitalize on it. And you started this conversation by talking about optimism. I'm more optimistic than ever because of technology and because of young people who many who of whom are driven to make an impact. Going back to the Africa example, if you jump into a clubhouse room and into about what's happening on the business side of things, it's exciting. It really it really is. And so um, the world is changing. We can't stop it. And so, um, so let, let's keep it moving. Um, and, and, and really the key there then though is reducing the risk while we're doing it. You asked earlier about, well, how do you reduce risk? Well, you find more customers, you know more. So you make less mistakes. You make sure that you get paid for things that you ship. You know, there's a, you know, there's the top 20 things that you can do to fail in international business. And we try to avoid that. Uh, on uh, every cost uh, around the world. So thank you for the, the conversation and really appreciate uh, you bringing us together today. Thank you very much, uh, Doug, you, Trista, and Howard. Um, it's been an excellent exchange. We we're at times out now, just saw a little uh, message pop up, but it's been a fascinating discussion. And we finished on an optimistic note. Um, and I think really there's a lot to look forward to. As you've all stated, uh, looking carefully at risk, but really looking at stakeholders and considering all those things very carefully. So it's been a wonderful um, experience to share this panel with you. And thank you to our dis panel of dis distinguished guests, Doug, Trista and Howard, and wishing everybody a wonderful day. Take care and hope to thank see you, you soon. Thanks, Howard. Thank you. Howard. Thank you. Trista. Thank, thank you. Trista. Thanks, so Thanks, Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. Bye for now. Great to meet everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye for now. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> and and now what? Where do we go from here? <laughs> I've got a I've got a teach now, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah, bye. Take me out. You can stay and talk a bit longer, but I have to sorry. You could join another se session as well. And you you know, you're free to join whatever session what you you want to. I'm 